I'm starting the recording now. And uh, as usual, I, I forgot to plug in my little clicker. I, 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 I plug it in every week, but I forget to plug it in every week. It's just. Skip, I can't see you, and there's just a half a screen. What, what am I doing wrong? I don't know. I've got a full screen. Does anybody else have a half screen? No, I'm a full screen. I'll do it well. I'm showing two people on. It's Johnny and Judy Johnson, Rod Koosman. The, uh, if I, I just if I was, that's what I was having troubles with, and I just kind of slid the screen, and it expanded the um, the slideshow portion, and it removed the video portion of people. Okay, I just see kinda, Rod. Like, I see Rod Kuzman, and then it's a black screen beside him. <clears throat> you need to I can see myself. Go left, go right, up or down. That's a, that's exactly what I'm seeing. Skip is Rod Kuzman and Johnny and Judy Jones. As yeah, that's what I'm. Yeah. Okay, hold on, everybody. So you should see uh, the webcam for Rod, Johnny, and Judy Jones, and then below that or to the side of it. Uh, Skip has the uh, title card that says Hebrews chapter 2 in white ah, type. Found it. If you see that, then you're good. Uh, you can you can open, you can enlarge or shrink uh, the, uh, the the main uh, 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 page or, or the main the main image. Uh, the window. It should, it should arrange it so you can see Skip's screen and whoever is on the video cam <laughs> yeah, I got it. Thanks. Okay, now uh, in the in the chat that I have up on mine, I don't know if you all can see that, but if you'll go to your chat, which is the little uh, you know the little circle you know that looks like somebody's talking, Michael has put the uh, email address of our of our blog and all of our uh, the recordings we've done for the last month or month and a half, however long we've been doing that. And by the way, Michael, I I did, uh, I converted, but I don't think I put Tuesday nights in there yet, but anyway. Okay, is everybody uh, up and running now, hopefully? All right, good. Okay, uh, Hebrews chapter two. Now, let me back up here. As we continue our study of, of Hebrews, we need to keep in mind that all of, of the almost 100 quotes in Hebrews. Now, about half of those are direct quotes. Half of them are, uh, you know, where it's kind of referred to. Nearly all of them are from the Septuagint translation of the Bible. And we've talked about this, but for those of you who haven't been on, uh, I'm going to go ahead and repeat this. The Septuagint is a Greek translation of the Old Testament, of the Hebrew Scriptures. Uh, and, and the audience that this was sent to was mostly Greek speaking. So it makes sense that the author of Hebrews would, would quote from the Septuagint, which is what they were familiar with. It was a language they were familiar with. So the, the, the author apparently assumed that his audience was very familiar with the Septuagint, and it, it was translated about 150 B.C., 150 years before Christ, by, the, uh, by, by Jews in Alexandria, Egypt, as I understand it. And so uh, what I've done here is I've, I've put a link up to an online Septuagint. So I don't know if you can click on this or if you need to copy it and paste, but if you want to see the Septuagint, and this, you know, the version that, that I've got uh, has every book separate, and, and it's, it's real easy to get to where you want to go. Okay, so the author begins chapter 2 with a reference back to chapter 1. Now, we don't know if, if Paul wrote this. We don't know who wrote this. A lot of us sort of lean toward Paul, but it doesn't really make any difference who wrote it. But the author uh, refers back to the previous 
and I'll, I'll use the term chapter loosely because there, there, you know, there weren't chapters until the translators started putting them in chapters. But that word therefore is a big word. Uh, the, the author starts off and says, therefore, we, you know, so what, what is he there for? Uh, I think the uh, New International has for this reason. Well, well for, for what reason? For what reason should we give more earnest heed to the things which we have heard? Um, and there's a couple of ways that that I've thought about that that we can look at that. There, might, I'm sure there's more, but till now God has spoken at different times and in different ways. If you remember exactly how Chapter One starts, through prophets and angels, and you will hear this ad nauseum through my uh, study of, uh, the. you know, if I continue leading this, every time I say angel, you're going to hear me say the word messenger, because angel was not translated. It's a transliteration of the word angelos. So whenever you see the word angel, think messenger. Uh, but anyway, uh, the author says that till now, God has spoken at different times and in different ways through prophets and messengers, but now he is speaking through his son. And this is from chapter one. Therefore, we must pay closer attention. Now, I, I, I'm going to give you another way to that, that, that I could see we might look at this, that, that therefore it could be because, as is stated in chapter one and a few other chapters in, in Hebrews, it could be because we are told that Jesus Christ is God's spokesman, that he is better than angels or better than messengers, that he's the creator and the sustainer of the universe and creator of man, of course, that he's in the very image of the Father. This is from chapter one. He's the heir of all things. He sits at the right hand of God, not sits on, but sits at. He's the firstborn son of God. We will follow, but we have not been, quote, born again, yet we have not been changed. We still have these old physical bodies, these tabernacles, these temporary existence things, and that the, the, the Christ lives eternally. So either way, uh, or some other way, the author notes how important it is to revert back and, and, and realize that he's saying, therefore, we need to, one, uh, oh, and these are five warnings that we're going to find as we go through uh, the rest of, of, of Hebrews. Uh, this first one is in, in verse one, but uh, it says, don't slip away or don't drift away, I think is the NASB, by neglecting the message of the Son of God. Well, yeah, that would not be a good idea. Do not neglect the message of the Son of God. That's a pretty good warning. Warning number two that we'll, we'll come uh, across. Listen and understand and obey Christ's teachings. Third, third warning, come out of your spiritual immaturity so you, you can comprehend the deeper meanings of Christ's teachings. And I'm sure you, you're all thinking of, of the chapter in Hebrews that he's referring to or where we get that warning. Number four, don't turn away from the once for all sacrifice of Jesus Christ and continue willfully sinning. We who accept Christ's sacrifice or on our way to salvation. Don't turn away from having faith in Christ, from accepting that sacrifice. That's a warning that, that we will come across in Hebrews. And number five, don't refuse or turn away from Christ like the Israelites turned away from Moses. So we'll, we'll cover those, those warnings. And I, I may forget to specifically mention them, but we will see them as we continue uh, through here, the words of, of Jesus Christ and the words about him are the most important words ever written. 
and we must pay close attention or closer attention to them than anything that's said before or after. And, and when we say before, we're talking about the prophets. And I'm going to talk a little bit. I'm going to use the word angels every once in a while. Uh, prophets and angels who are God's messengers. And, and it's not that we should ignore what was said before. It's that we should add on to and consider it more important to consider what Christ said and what was said about Christ. And this is necessary, as verse 1 says, lest we slip away or we become apathetic from this understanding about Christ. The author of Hebrews really comes down hard on how important Jesus Christ is and how much more important he is than the prophets and the angels slash messengers that came before. And it says in verse one, here's how much more important it is. You can lose your salvation if you drift away. This is an indication that, that there in, in, in Hebrews, this is an indication that the author feels or believes that there's a hyper belief about angels among Jewish believers. Otherwise, why would the author spend so much time warning them of, of these things? Okay, so it, certainly in the first two chapters, and I hadn't really dived in any, any farther yet, the author speaks of angels, messengers, several times in Hebrews. Now, in the Old Testament, which we, our little group calls the Hebrew Scriptures, but since we're looking at the Septuagint and it's translated in Greek, let's just say the Old Testament, the Hebrew word malak should have been translated messenger, but it was translated angel. And I don't know, uh, you know, it looks like the, the ones translated the New Testament influenced the ones, and it could have been the same ones that were translating the Old Testament, but in, in, the, in the Greek scriptures, the New Testament, the word angelos means messenger. So you've got malak and angelos, and both of those words should have been translated messenger. Now, the, the, the author now makes a rhetorical statement, and, and I'm going to go back to chapter one here. Here's a rhetorical statement that the uh, that the author made, and, and as a matter of fact, it's a it's a quote from uh, the uh, Septuagint. To which of the messengers, and I've got the Young's Living tran literal translation here because it's the only one I found that actually translates the word messengers. He says rhetorically, to which of the messengers did he ever say, "Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies my footstool." footstool. Guess what? The answer is none. Zero. It's rhetorical. Which one? Gabriel? Michael? Lucifer? Certainly not. No, not a single angel did Christ or God ever say, sit at my right hand. So now lest we forget that we're in chapter two, I'm going to go back to, to verse one again. In the King James, it says, therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed. There's that word, therefore, again. We ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. Now, I've got two other translations here that say it almost the same, but just a hair differently. Therefore, we must pay much more careful heed to the things we've heard so that we will not drift away. That's a complete Jewish Bible. And uh, the phrase drift away is, the meaning is, is like a ship that's tied up to the dock, to the moor, and has broken loose and is drifting away. And the author is warning us, don't drift away. This is the most important thing that you've ever come across in your life. And then uh, he begins in verse 2, and I think what I'm going to do here, uh, yeah, I'm just going to read all of uh, 2, 3, and 4. He says, For if the word spoken through angels proved unalterable, 
And every transgression and disobedience received a just penalty. And I'll come back to that in a minute. How shall we escape if we neglect an even greater salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by them that heard him? God also, bearing them witness, both with signs and wonders and with different miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit, according to his own will. Now, the the Jews, and, and I, I'm using, we all know, I think we all know, it's, it's Israel, but the ones living in Palestine and the ones most likely that the author is writing at this point were the, 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 the Jews living in Palestine. He could have sent it out to more of the family, but we don't know. But he, the, the Jews were very familiar with the penalties of breaking the law, weren't they? Uh, it said every transgression and disobedience received a just penalty. Can you imagine what our lives or the end of our lives would be like or would have been like if we were punished for every transgression that we committed? The author of Hebrews seemed to want to be sure they realized that it was even more important that they realized the the penalty for ignoring or drifting away from our belief in Jesus Christ. Uh, it's, it's like the author was saying this. If you think those Old Testament penalties were bad, think about this one, loss of salvation. Now, one thing that we all need to always remember, and I'm pretty sure that, you know, all of you do, there is no salvation in the law of God. That's not what the law is for. No salvation. You cannot earn salvation by observing the law. The law is to teach us how to worship God, how to live happily, how to treat others, you know, and, and there's more things. The law is a schoolmaster and so on. The law was never intended to save. And, you know, and, and it, it bothers me when I hear some of my friends talk down about the law because they have it in their head because they've been taught since birth that the law is bad. That, you know, God really messed up, you know, when he gave that law out. And I'm being a little facetious here. But, but you know, they, they won't have anything to do with the law because they believe that we believe and the Jews believed, and, and maybe the Jews did, but we certainly don't, believe that the law is, we keep it in order to be saved. This is the message spoken by the Lord Jesus Christ, not by messengers. Now, as I said earlier, based on the first two chapters of Hebrews, angels and maybe even the worship of angels, because it's you know if you've if you've looked through or if you've been with our group as we've gone through the epistles of Paul, we've run across people that were worshiping angels, that were uh, Gnostics, which means uh, intelligence, knowledge, uh, and and uh, ascetics that 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 punish themselves and so on, and the, the pagans that came in who had a belief in all of these little G gods and angels and, and so on. And so apparently, based on what we're reading in Hebrews, there, was, there were some issues about that with the people that the author is writing. And we don't know exactly why or even what, but the author does seem to be very concerned and, and wants to straighten that problem out. Now, here's something uh, that, I, that I ran across. Uh, verse 2 speaks of the word, logos, spoken through messengers. Now, one of the customs, and now I'm not, I'm not saying this is true. I'm saying this is one of the beliefs of many Jews. I'm not going to generalize and say all Jews, but one of their beliefs is that other than the Ten Commandments, which were written by the very finger of God, 
that God gave his law through angels at Mount Sinai or gave a portion of his law through messengers at Mount Sinai. Now that doesn't mean that God didn't speak from the burning bush and and, and that, that he didn't write the Ten Commandments with his own finger, but a lot of Jews believe that much of the law was given by angels. While the Old Testament verses don't really say this, there's a couple in the New Testament which surprisingly do say something about this. The first verse that I'm going to show you was uh, in the sermon given by Stephen, and it got him killed, if you remember. Uh, in, in Acts 7.52, he, he says, well, which one of the prophets have your fathers not persecuted and killed? They've slain them. I mean, listen, those, those Pharisees and the Sadducees and the leaders who heard Stephen say, say this got so angry when they heard him say this and other things that they killed him. They murdered him. They, they stoned him to death. But, it, but it, you know, Stephen said to them, well, well, okay, hey, you think so much of these prophets? Great. Which ones did your fathers not kill? They slain them, which showed before of the coming of the just one. They prophesied of the Messiah, of whom you now have been betrayers and murderers. You know, you all killed the, the Christ. But verse 53 is the one I want to zero in on. It said, who have received the law by the disposition of angels and have not kept it? Now, that's just a little reference to uh, something that the Jews believe. And then in Galatians, it says, and, and this is another uh, place where we read about what the law is, is for. What serves the law? And I think this this is talking about the, the law of uh, of uh, sacrifices and so on. But anyway, it was added because of transgressions till the seed should come. Now, when he wrote this, the seed had come to whom the promise was made. And here's the part again I'm talking about. And it was ordained by angels or messengers in the hand of a mediator. Uh, anybody have any thoughts or comments on, on, on that or any more info about how, the, how you know many Jews believe that that the law came through, uh, or some of the law came through angels. Hello. Yes, go. I didn't want to start talking. I thought you'd call. Um, okay, let me let me say this right up front. Yes, everyone, start talking if you have something to say. Otherwise, I don't know. I don't know you have anything thought, to say. So go for it. Bernard. I thought the protocol. <laughs> I thought the protocol was you look to see an active mic and you call on people in order. But anyway, I, uh, I can't see them. I can't. See oh, them. I didn't know that. Oh, okay, okay. Anyway, um, I might have missed this through all. It's a lot of, a lot of meat here. A lot of different things to think about that uh, you've presented about the angel, about angels or the translation. I guess my question is, and maybe you covered this and I missed it how does one know the difference i guess through the context one knows the difference of whether or not um god's word is talking about an actual angel of god like a spiritual being of some sort versus some other messenger is there yeah. is there nope you hit it context. context you gotta you gotta read the context and one of the reasons that i zero in so much on this is that i do know that that there there have been times uh, in particularly in the Old Testament, when Jesus Christ Himself was speaking with uh, Abraham or uh, you know Lot or you know whoever, and it says angel, but if you look at the word messenger, you see the possibility uh, that it was Christ Himself. So yes, context, Bernard, you're exactly right. So so at times, then I'm, I'm presuming that at times, if I'm understanding you correctly, that sometimes the word angel is used to refer to God himself, to Christ. And, and of course, the way I understand it, and I think the way that probably most of all, all of us here believe is that every instance where there was a human being communicating with God in, in any way, shape or form directly, it was Christ, not the Father. That's the way I understand it. And I know there's some, some differences in uh, some people feel that it was the Father mm -hmm. sometimes. Uh, and and it, it's kind of like a calendar. I'm not getting into that. <laughs> uh, so 
yeah, yeah. I mean, we've got people on both sides of, the, of that issue, but it, it was not an angel, you know, in those. All cases. right. So anyway, I guess my question was that sometimes, uh, or to, for your confirmation, sometimes the Bible will refer to uh, God as by quote angel. Yes. Angel. Because, because the word, because the word, because the word wasn't translated. You know, there, there, there are, I'll just throw this out. There are three or four words that, that really jump out at me that were never translated. They're transliterations. One is baptizo. Baptizo was not translated. Baptizo means to be whelmed or to be immersed. But the translators didn't ever translate it. They put baptized. So people say, well, I was baptized when they were sprinkled or I was baptized when, when they were uh, uh, had water poured on their head where it had the word been translated it would have said immersed and we you know everybody would I think everybody would believe the same way uh, anyway can you please one more time explain the difference between translation and transliteration transliteration is where they take the Hebrew or the Greek word angelos for instance in the Greek which sounds like angels and they simply came up with a word that sounded like it baptizo is transliterated to baptism or baptize. It sounds like it. It's not translated. I don't know if that clears it up. Yeah. Yes. Thanks. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Um, you know, look. Will you go back one screen to the um, to the verse? Yeah, this one. Let's see. He received the law of angels and have not kept it. Not Are you hearing me? Yeah, it's there's a scrape. Yeah, go ahead. I, I, I no. muted, so you're good to go, Win. Okay, sorry, Bernard. Um, if you knew, you know, Exodus 20, it said it's God that gives the commandments, He's the one that delivered them. It doesn't say that it was delivered by angels. So, um, I would have to to think that when it says we receive the law of the dispensation of angels, it was not that they were delivering it, God delivered it, they were reinforcing it maybe. Um, they were, you know, it's kind of, kind of like all of the, when we're talking about Christ in the Old Testament and, you know, who was it that Jacob wrestled with? Was it an angel or was it, a, or was it Christ himself? But, you know, some place says angel, some place says Christ. Um, my my point being is that it doesn't seem to me anywhere in Scripture that they are delivering anything that they that does not come as a direct um, command or they're carrying out something that God gives them to do. Just a thought. Yeah, I agree 100. percent It's this is just a belief of the Jews, and I. You know, when when I prepare a Bible study, I try to give you all the information I can, and uh, I agree with you 100% that God uh, gave the law. Now, he may have given it to an, an angel that, you know, that, that said it. But I don't know, but I agree with you 100%. The law came from God, and this is just a Jewish uh, uh, belief by some Jews. Well, it's good. In, in context, the verses you have up, if we're looking at this in context, uh, you know, verse 52 is talking about the prophets, which you're, the fathers persecuted. So obviously the, these are, these are, you know, messengers. These are physical beings that ha were able to be killed. So they're not supernatural beings and they brought a messenger. So I guess when you get down to verse 53, I think it's in reference to, uh, verse 52. So they received the law by the disposition of messengers and they haven't kept it. I think that's what, at least in this section. What it's in reference to, but obviously all law comes from Abba, Father, God. Uh, thank you for correcting me, Michael. Here's the one place I didn't use the word messenger, and I was wrong. <laughs> You're exactly right. It was given by messengers, and uh, you know I try really hard, but you know when you see angels a thousand times, it, it's it's hard to to every time. But you, I think you're exactly right. As is when uh, that. Uh, uh, the the belief of the Jews is is uh, probably uh, just a belief of the Jews. So, okay. Um, Skip. Yeah, Jim. Hey, Skip. We, we could we could even include uh, Moses in that because uh, 
you know, some of what God said to Moses, Moses then put into writing, you know, uh, part of the law from the messenger Moses. Yep. I mean, obviously he received it from God, but uh, but he would even he would even fall in the category of uh, angels. Okay, Blake, were you going to say something? Well, yeah, I was. I was actually just going to speak to the the you know this first paragraph in chapter two being a, just a real admonishment to to not do it the way we did it last time. Uh, something like you know, um, <laughs> look, um, we had God who who rent us from the uh, the tyrant uh, Pharaoh, and we 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 fell away, um, and now we have. Um, God incarnate who sacrificed himself for your salvation don't go slipping away um, you know don't don't and and then and that this is also very um, applicable to us you know that we have these we have awesome resources and, and yet we we seem to slip away um, you know and just uh, for what I think Paul is speaking to the background right you know you want to look at who's saying what to whom and what was the background of listening um, and he knew this was going to strike a chord with them, I'm pretty sure. Um, and also, uh, this word Holy Ghost, it, you know, just to you know, point out that that is, is pneuma, right? That's the word pneuma there, which is always, you know, when you see Holy Ghost there, Where do it I just means spirit. Where do I need to be? Uh, chapter 2, verse 4, Hebrews. Okay. Yeah, see, I'm on a different verse in my, there we go. All right, sorry, go ahead. Um, no, yeah, and that uh, in verse four there, the Holy Ghost is pneuma. And just, you know, because they chose to translate it Holy Ghost, it, it really, you know, it creates a lot of confusion as to what that alludes to. Um, um, you know, people feeling, you know, the, the doctrine of the Trinity. Um, anyways, but, and, and lastly, uh, from verse two to verse four, that's all one sentence. Paul, Paul seems to just, you know... <laughs> have the ability to write very long sentences. So <laughs> that's all. Yeah, it, it is very Polish, no doubt, no doubt. Um, oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah, don't say Paul. <laughs> Real quick, uh, I put it on chat, but people might not see it. Uh, in my, the New King James Version in my computer Bible renders that verse uh, spirit, Holy Spirit not uh holy ghost yeah um anytime i see the word ghost i generally especially if it's capitalized i automatically just say spirit when i'm reading the bible in my head or if i'm reading it aloud however there are a couple places i don't remember where where um the word ghost is used maybe a specter is the original word or something i can't remember but there are places where uh, i think it may be when somebody conjures up a a, a specter or something like that the word is used more accurately but i i agree i always use spirit because that's more accurate for numa yeah and by the and, way and ruach me, too. do what Rod? sorry and, and ruach ruach, ruach. numa is the yeah. spirit in the or breath but the funny thing is, is that both means breath whether it's ruach in the old testament in hebrew or numa in the new testament uh greek uh which is spirit but the interesting thing is the literal word actually means breath so there's really there's a lot of, that's a whole study in and of itself it's really interesting yeah uh, it really is. i went back to the chats and and bernard makes a really good point here he says an untied boat drifts away very gradually and silently and often goes unnoticed by the boat owner which is an excellent point bernard and and it, you know i I don't know if any of you all have ever gotten to the point where you were drifting a little bit. Uh, about, ni about 1976, before most of you were born, um, I was drifting away. Uh, I had attended the worldwide from, I, I attended worldwide from 74 to 78, but about 76, I might hit the church door about once a month. And uh, some things happened and stirred mm -hmm. me up, thank God. and. I hope God's hand was in it, but anyway. And then Bernard also says, if we understand the word angel as messenger, then aren't all prophets angels? Yes, including Moses, which somebody said just a minute ago. 
Uh, and then Michael says it gives a more interesting take on Paul's statement in 1 Corinthians 6, 3. What, what is that, Michael? That's where uh, Paul says, don't you know that you'll be judging angels? Okay, okay. And then uh, John Wilson says, that, so they're both spiritual and physical angels. Yes, because all both are messengers. I, I hate to jump out on this limb, but I would say all of us could be considered angels because we're messengers. Uh, we're spreading the gospel. So Mike just said, Mike just said something that just struck a chord in my mind about judging. It brings a different method of the uh, way to look at you know judging angels, uh, judging messengers. It also brings to mind that those who perhaps weren't carrying the correct message, who were supposed to be messengers, who for whatever reason they didn't carry the right message, and that maybe that's part of that judgment too. It just came to mind. Good point. That's a good. That's a real good point. And 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 uh, the, the scripture Michael just mentioned uh, is an example of context. That scripture, the context seems to be spirit beings, not Moses and 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 you know Isaiah, you know human human messengers. I think that 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 shows that we have to be careful. And I think everybody already knew this anyway. We have to be careful about context. You know, two or three things we have to do as we study the scriptures, and there's there's no way around it. One, you have to be able to figure out whether a scripture is talking to his audience only or to his audience plus all of us Christians who have, have come later. That's very important. And it's hard sometimes to figure that out. And we're really going to get into that in in this study of, of chapter two, whether the author is speaking of Christ alone, whether the author is speaking of man alone, or whether the author is speaking of both. Now, I'm not sure how important that is as long as we get the message and we know that it might apply to us. It might apply just to Christ. But, but as I say, we're going to run across that a whole bunch in if 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 we if we get through today's study because uh, this is really a, a a good study and I'm 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 loving the the uh, conversation so far. Okay, so now let's see here. We're ready for verse. Yep. Thanks, Kim. Yeah. Before we go, before we go uh, moving forward there, uh, going back here to verse one, therefore we ought to give more honesty to the things which we have heard, uh, reminds me of the exhortation in the book of Jude, verse three, where he was reminding people, uh, I Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful of me to write unto you and exhort you that we should earnestly contend for the faith that was once delivered to the saints. And I think that's the message, uh, you know, contending for the faith, not forgetting those things which were delivered. That's the, the, not the spiritual message that was coming through, at least to me anyway. Yeah, that absolutely that makes sense. And 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 in 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 Galatians where it says, where Paul says, you know, I'm I'm absolutely shocked that you guys have already forgotten what I taught you, and gone to another gospel, which is not really a gospel anyway. There's no good news in it, you know. And uh, I, I think that goes along with what you uh, what you read in 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 Jude. You know, there are enough warnings in the Greek scriptures that there were people that were drifting away. There were people that weren't sticking with what they had learned. And the the author of Hebrews says it again, you know, don't drift away. It's very important, very important. All right, uh, verse five. Now, again, uh, I, I told you that the author speaks about angels or messengers a lot. And sometimes he's talking about spirit beings. Sometimes he's talking about uh, physical messengers. But in, in this case right here, verse 5, it, it seems pretty clear that he's talking about spirit beings. For he did not subject to angels, to spirit beings, 
the world to come concerning which we are speaking. Now, in, in verse 6, uh, I'll put that up. This is quoted from Psalm 8 in the Septuagint. And, and the Septuagint is not a whole lot different than, than the uh, translation that we have in the King James Version or the NASB, but it's, it's a little bit different. So if you try to compare word for word, uh, it's not going to work. But in, in verse 6, it says, one testified, and I think that one would be, you know, David probably, but the psalmist, whoever that is, and it's quoted from Psalm 8 in the Septuagint. But one has testified somewhere, Psalm 8, saying, what, what, is, what is man that, that you remember him, or the son of man that you're concerned about him? Here's one of those spots is he talking about humans? Is he talking about Christ? Is he talking about both? You know, I'll, I'll leave that up to up to up to up to you all to to figure figure that out for yourself or, or to make a determination. And he goes on in verse seven, and he says, "You've made him for a little while lower than the angels." The King James says, "You've made him a little lower than the angels." And then I'm going to come back and give you a little a little different, and I think quote more accurate translation in a, in a minute but you've made him for a little while lower than the angels which is accurate you've crowned him with glory and honor you've appointed him over the works of your hands and you've put all things in subjection under his feet well it sounds very much like he's talking about our savior about christ uh, for in subjecting all three things to him he left nothing that's not subject to him but we don't see it yet. He hasn't returned to the earth. He hasn't taken over. He hasn't, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That ain't happened yet. But we do see him who was made for a little while lower than the angels, namely Jesus. So he, you know, the author nails it here, tells us who he's talking about. Because of the suffering of death, and he was crowned with glory and honor when he was resurrected so that by the grace of God, and folks, if it weren't for the grace of God, none of us would be here, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for who? For all of us, for every single one of us. So, you know, sometimes we have to make a determination who the scripture is talking about, but but, but we we have to look past that and and look at the message that he's uh, he's given us uh, in in verse six going back to verse six uh, what is man that you remember him the the author's comment and and when I say the author both the author of Psalms and the author who has quoted Psalm eight uh, says why are you mindful of him? You, you know, what do you carry such a small, teeny, tiny part of creation? It seems that he's talking about human beings. That, but when he says son of man, it seems he's talking about Christ. Verse 6, as I said, is quoted from the Septuagint. Um, Skip? Yes. Um, in my... Um... NIV, it doesn't have the Son of Man capitalized. Um, and it makes it definitely sound just more like he's talking to human beings. You know, because mine just says, what is mankind that you're mindful of them? A son, a son of man that you care for him. Um, you made him lower than the angels, crowned him with glory and honor. But then when you get down to verse 9, it's it. Um, it says, but we do see Jesus, who was made lower than the angels for a little while, now crowned with glory and honor. And, and the way it's phrased in the NIV makes it sound like there is the, there are two things being discussed, man, humankind versus Jesus. You know, so mine seems to indicate that the first half verses six through eight are referring to humankind. And then a comparison starting in verse nine 
um, about Jesus. So yeah, I think I think you're exactly right. Um, I don't. Know I never what... saw it that way before. Thanks, Jill. That is great. Yeah, uh, the way the King James does verse one, it seems like you know in part. The first part's talking about man, and then the second part talking about Christ. But like you said, there are other translations that don't look at it that way. So, but we do know, as you said, when we get down to verse nine, that he's that he's talking about uh, Jesus Christ. Now, there, there's a couple of interesting things I want to show you here um, in the Septuagint in Psalm eight three. I, I think this is. Uh, this really caught my attention. The psalmist sets out and says, for I will regard the heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have established. Okay, so so the, the, the psalmist speaks of the heavens and the creation of God, and then he says, well, what's this puny man that you're talking about? What in the world? Why are you concerned about this little puny man look at the universe look at the earth look at a tree look at all these things who is this guy that you are mindful of him why do you even care you know and, and i think the psalmist does a better job here of of making us understand how tiny how how unimportant we are in the the, the scheme of the creation. However, that's not the way it's always going to be. And in, in verse four, was it talking about Christ? Because Christ was a teeny tiny man, at, you know, for a while, for 30, 31 years, 33 years, whatever. Um, so he, he, you know, he's asking the question, I'm looking at the universe and you're worried about this man. And then the, the psalmist in verse nine, five says, oh, I see what you're saying. You made him a little less than angels or for a little while less than the angels. And now you've crowned him with glory and honor. This seems to be speaking of Christ. And you've set him over the works of your hands. Now, at that point, He's, he's, he seems to be talking about both because man was put over the creation down here on the earth. But we haven't been crowned with glory and honor yet. But yet we have been set over the works of his hands and you've put all things under his feet. Sheep, oxen, cattle, birds, fish, sea creatures. O oh Lord, our Lord, how wonderful is your name in all the earth. Both Christ and man have been put over God's creation. Christ more so because, number one, he created it. But man, you know, we're going to be there one of these days, and we're going to be over everything. We're going to be changed. We're going to become spirit beings. We're going to become part of the God family, so to speak. Now, uh, Let's see. I've got something. I hope it's coming up next. Putting this thing in some kind of order was was kind of kind of tough for 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 this for this study. But it was it was God's intention, as you can see in Genesis one twenty eight, that God said to man, "Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, rule over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the sky, and over every living thing that moves on the earth." Exactly the same thing he says in Psalm uh, the Septuagint, in beginning in verse uh, uh, beginning in verse six, and so we have been put over God's creation here on the earth, the physical creation. Now, as we've already talked about, and, and Bernard mentioned, context is king. You've got to read the context. You can't read one verse. You can't, a proof, proof text, I believe is what we call it. Uh, when he says son of man, if it's, you know, many times it's talking about Christ. For the son of man is Lord even of the, the Sabbath day. Context, what's the context? 
context is somebody's Lord of the Sabbath day. Guess what? It ain't me. It's Christ. And in Matthew 12, 40, uh, the Son of Man shall be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Context. Talking about Jesus the Christ. Now, here's something I, that I, I spent quite a bit of time on because this is so interesting to me. I've come back to verse 7, and I want to zero in on one word, the word made. You have made him. Now, I, I know that over the centuries there's been a, an argument with some people that Jesus Christ was created that he didn't exist prior to uh, his becoming a, 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 a baby. Well, sorry, don't buy that. Not going to talk about it. Um, it it's, it's one of those things that, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about just about everything here in, in, our, in our Bible study. That isn't one of them. But anyway, the word made, did, God did make man, but he didn't make Christ. So what's the Greek? The Greek for made in verse 7 is not the same, does not hold the same meaning as the word made that we use today. The Greek word is a lot to owe, and it does not mean created. It doesn't mean made. It means to be made less, to be lowered to be inferior or to decline in importance. So the, 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 a better translation would be you have lowered him for a little while lower than the angels. Now in verse 9, which we'll come to in a minute, uh, it's the same Greek word, but in, in verse 9, they translate it made a little lower. Uh, Jesus Christ was not made. He was not created. The author was saying, and, and I, it, it's basically literally what it's saying was that he was lowered lower than the angels, not made or created. And this lower, this lowering was only temporary. So I, I think that, you know, looking at the Greek in this case, I think is, is very, very important. Yeah. Yeah. You have, you have um, I think, verses that would substantiate that, like Philippians 2, right? Yeah, that's about well. That's there. Go ahead and read it, Lynn. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. Read those. Is that what you're saying? Oh, I mean, this this explains it completely. Have this attitude in yourself. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, I'm I'm uh, going in here. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was in Christ Jesus, and you know that's that's a theme that Paul has throughout his uh, throughout his uh, epistles. Be like Christ. Surrender like Christ. Put people first like Christ. Be willing to die like Christ. So have this attitude in yourselves, which was in, also in Christ Jesus, who, although he had previously existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. He, he, he didn't have to hang on to it. He was more than happy to give up his previous existence. And I don't know any other way to put it. Uh, but he emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, of a human being, just a plain old man, and being made in the likeness of men. Christ emptied himself from his previous glory. He was not created. Now, here's another Greek word that, that we want to, I think we want to look at, the word emptied. It's uh, kino'o. And it means to make empty or to evacuate, to divest oneself of one's prerogatives, to abase one's self, to empty or void oneself. And I think that's a, a great example or a great definition of what Christ did. He was Almighty God. 
He had existed forever. He created the heavens and the earth. He sustains the universe. Now, God the Father is over all and, and so on, but but uh, it, it seems that, that he sent his son to, to do certain things. So he emptied himself of his previous glory. Um, and, and we could spend all day long, and I'm not trying to start an argument here, but we could spend all day long talking about whether that, that Jesus was 100% man and 100% God when he was on the earth and so on. And I know that there are, are, are people, I've got a lot of friends that believe that, that every second God uh, Christ was on the earth, he was 100% God and he was 100% man. I can't get my hands wrapped around a newborn baby being God. I can't wrap my hands around a three-year-old throwing a fit or a two-year-old throwing a fit that's God. He could have destroyed the entire world. You know, and I know I don't mean to be facetious but, but and, and ridiculous, but that's, and I have a problem with God dying, which is exactly what happened to our Savior. It's exactly what happened to Jesus Christ. So th that's that's just the way I feel about it, and hopefully we're, we're not going to get in a in a in a big argument about it. Um, hey Skip. Yeah, Michael. As, as an anecdote to the you brought it up in terms of why translations are so important to understand and how different beliefs can get uh, you know created by uh, a mistranslations or misunderstanding uh, in India. Um, one of the huge problems that existed there when I was out there that I've had to work on to correct was with Sagar Jali's congregation. He has uh, 30 different pastors out there. Uh, Sagar Jali is the guy that runs the orphanage uh, in Palakalu, which is about two and a half hours drive from the Kampalas. His pastors were arguing because they were of the belief that oh, Jesus was a created being, that God made him, created him because their scriptures were uh, Telugu Bibles, but they were translated from English. Their Bibles are translated from English into their language. So when you do that, and you know, um, you're know you gonna have these issues where the, you know, uh, when you're reading these verses, it makes it sound like Jesus was, you know, was made. And they were going based on that. So um, we got them Bibles that were translated into their language in Telugu, directly from the Hebrew and the Greek. Uh, and it completely, I'd explained to them that Jesus was not created. So th this is why it's so important to have uh, the correct translation understanding because it can sow a whole lot of confusion um, as a result. And, uh, you know, you had, you know, you know, so many brethren that had to correct their understanding uh, when I was out there. So since you had brought it up, I thought I'd show uh, relate a real world uh, current situation that is under correction. Yeah, and I, you know, if, if, if all we do is look at the King James or all we do is look at the whatever version that, that we like, um, you know, none of them are 100% 100% accurate. And every once in a while you have to look at the Hebrew. And fortunately, I've got this wonderful Bible program called Word Search. And I have about six dictionaries. I don't just have to look at Strong. Strong's is only a starting place for, for me, fortunately, because this this Bible software is just really, really fantastic. Now, um, okay. Hey, Skip. Yeah, Johnny. Uh, in Young's uh, according to the Bible, yeah. most of the places, as you say, is the uh, angel is uh messenger yeah and in young's concordance they show the translation of angels in uh, psalms 8 verse 5 being elohim well you just moved us to the very next thing i'm gonna say <laughs> how about that um okay uh what johnny said is ex ex exactly right the if you go back to Psalm 8, 5, um, and let me let me get on that on that. Okay, uh, Hebrews 2, 7 is quoted from Psalm 8, 5. 
So let me just bring that up. There we go. All right. For you have made him a little lower than the angels and crowned him with glory. The, the word angels, the Hebrew word is Elohim. Now, for, for whatever reason, the author of Hebrews did not bring it across that way, nor did the King James Version, nor did any other version that I have looked at. I, I don't think, I think I checked about 10 different translations, and all of them have angels. Okay, but I, I'm not going to argue with this. I'm, I, it's just something interesting because he was made lower than God. We were made lower than God. So I don't, I don't have a problem with this. I just don't quite understand why they didn't uh, put it that way. Maybe that it offended their sensibilities or something. I don't, I don't really, you know, I don't really know. But that word should have been translated God. Uh, but there again, well, yeah, could, yeah, yeah. could it have? Hang on. Could it have been? Well, go ahead. Jill, go ahead. Well, I, Mark and I have been doing some study, and um, the, uh, the word Elohim um, is a category rather than a name of God. It's a category that, that includes all the spirit beings. It includes... It can refer, it, to, it can refer to the Almighty Father, <clears throat> but it is a because he is part of that category of spirit beings that are eternal, but it also includes um, the the angels that were created, the evil ones and the good ones, um, the seraphim, the cherubim, any of these spirit categories. So it's it can refer to little g gods as well as the almighty God. So it, if you if you think of Elohim as being a class or a category, um, instead of an individual or a title it help it, it kind of helps you understand that concept a bit better i agree that's great good job yeah ron dart used to say you know if you think about it like uh describing uh you being on a team um uh, you know I'll, I'll use the houston oilers you know um all, all of the angels and all of God are, are part of a team called the Houston Oilers. They can say that they are Houston Oilers, um, but they're also individually Houston Oilers as well. Um, I don't know if that, that helped me understand that they're part of a team to describe the supernatural realm. They're part of that supernatural realm. Um, and that's that also really helps you to understand Psalm 82, but we won't go there. Um, <laughs> but yeah, the, it being a category. Come again? We can do that later, Blake. You're obviously yeah. reading Heiser as well. Yeah, I'm reading Heiser as well. Correct. Uh, but yeah, anyways, yeah, very good description, Jill. Very good. Yeah, thanks. Okay, uh, let's see. We're at chapter 2, verse 8. By the way, in case you haven't already noticed it or don't already know it, the NASB capitalizes all of the quotes. And that's one of the reasons I'm using the NASB as much as I am today, because uh, reading the King James Version, you 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 kind of miss some of this stuff. But when when it's the NASB, it just really jumps out at you. So uh, in in verse eight, and we're already up to verse eight after an hour. Wow. Um, you have put all things in subjection under his feet. Uh, I think we've already read verse eight uh, and and nine, I guess. Okay, let me see. No, there, there, there. Okay, um, the Jews would have only understood these verses to be speaking of man, right? They would not have known that this is speaking of also of the Messiah, of the Christ, the anointed one. But from our position in history, we can see that it's speaking of both. Um, and so uh, most likely here, you know, putting all things 
in subjection under his feet. Currently, he's talking about Christ, but one of these days it'll be it'll be us also. Uh, verse nine, the subject becomes Jesus Christ. You know, leading up to this, you you could you could go either way, but it seems like in verse nine, the subject, since it names him specifically. Uh, the, remind, the author reminds us that Jesus Christ has existed eternally and for a little while was lowered lower than the angels, going back to the translation of, of the word. But, but we see him, and this is, this is the author's writing this after Christ has, Jesus has lived, he's died, he's been resurrected, he's, he's the Christ, the Messiah, the Savior of mankind. But we, we see him who was made for a little while. He was lowered lower than the angels for a little while, namely Jesus, because of the suffering of death. Okay, this is what Jesus went through. We haven't been through this. We haven't, we haven't been through the suffering of death. I'm not saying we, you know, people hadn't died. I'm just saying this certainly the same way he did. He was crowned with glory and honor so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. I think I may have read that earlier. I don't know. And it may be that I just remember it from going over it 50 times as I was trying to prepare for this. In verse 10, for it was fitting for him because he created everything for whom are all things and through whom are all things in bringing many sons to glory. That's us. To, be perf to perfect the author of their salvation, this is Christ, through sufferings. Only Christ was lowered, L-A-T-O, declined in importance by di divesting himself of the Godhead and becoming a human being. Um, verse 11 speaks more about Christ. And it's interesting because he, he, he talks about Christ and us in the same sentence. He says, for both he who sanctifies, that's Christ, he has set us apart, and those who are set apart are all from one Father, for which reason he's not ashamed to call them brethren. We, you know, the, the, this this whole plan, has been for us, for man, to become a part of the Elohim, as, as uh, Joe was talking about a while ago. The, 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 the category of, of uh, uh, supernatural beings, if you will. Uh, he's, Christ is not ashamed to call us brethren. Now, verse 12 is quoted from Psalm 22. And I found this kind of interesting. Um, verse 12 is quoted from Psalm 22, 22, okay? But Psalm 22 is one that we read at Passover. I, I, know, I know that our group reads this Psalm at Passover. It is about the crucifixion of our Savior. And yet the second part of Psalm 22 is, is quoted by the author of, of Hebrews. And, you know, we're, as a matter of fact, we were talking about this, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me last week? Bernard was talking about it, and he, he has a, 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 you know, he gave us a paper if we wanted to read it. But he, he begins Psalm 22 prophesying about his crucifixion. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You're far from my deliverance. And, and I'm, you know, I'm groaning, I'm hurting. I'm, I'm, you know, oh my God, I cry by day. You do not answer and by night I have no rest. I'm not going to get into all that. I'm just saying it's interesting that the author of Hebrews uses Psalm 22 when he gets down to verse 12. Um, he he uh okay i i, don't, I didn't i didn't i didn't uh, paste the rest of this 
Psalm 22, but here are Christ's words. He calls himself a worm, a reproach of men, despised of the people. He says they sneer at him and they yell, let him deliver you. If you remember when he was on the, cro on the cross, they said, if you truly are the son of God, come off of that cross, which I've always thought was rather ironic because if he had, he wouldn't have been our savior or we wouldn't have been saved. If you are the son of God, he's poured out like water, he says. He has no strength. And he, and he says, some specific things. They pierced my hands and my feet. You can see his bones. Now, if you all understand the scourging like, like I do, and I, I'm, you know, I could be wrong, but I understand the scourging as him being whipped unmercifully time after time after time after time with these whips that had, you know, seven or eight, uh, uh, different threat throngs, thongs, if you will, that had sharp objects in them. And his skin was literally ripped from his body. And that when he was put on the cross, his bones were showing. His bones weren't broken, but they were showing. And then he goes on in, in, in verse 20, uh, Psalm 22 and said, they divide his garments among them and cast lots for his clothing. So what I'm saying is I think it's interesting that the author uses the second part of Psalm 22 after prophesying about Christ's crucifixion. And verse, beginning in verse 12, it's, it's, it's good news. I will proclaim your name to my brethren in the midst of the congregation. I will sing your praise. I will put my trust in him. Behold, I and the children which God has given me. You know, it's like these, he, he's, he's written them in two totally different books, but it's in the same psalm. And in Hebrews 14, I mean, verse 14, he, the author shows the similarities between Christ and man. Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, what was Jesus? He was flesh and blood. What are we? We're flesh and blood. We share that similarity. He himself likewise also partook of the same. He came down here. He took on the, uh, the, the, the tabernacle of a human being that through death he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and might free those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all their lives. Think about it. If we didn't believe in Christ and, and we didn't know what our ultimate, that we will have ultimate salvation, that mankind will ultimately be saved, we would be fearful of, of death. I know I would. Now, like us, yes. Somebody? Uh, I just want to, you know, I've, I've just been thinking for, for quite some time that the reason why we meet, the compelling reason, may be to praise God. Right. That's exactly right. So like us, Jesus Christ had a fleshly body. He had aches and pains. When he hit his thumb with a hammer, it hurt and it bled. I mean, think about it. He was a carpenter. What carpenter do you know that hadn't hit his thumb with a hammer? Missed the nail, hit my thumb. The, the only difference is that when, when I did it, I said I, I, I let out a word or two I probably shouldn't have let out, and Christ didn't. You know, it, it hurt and it bled when he, when he hurt himself. He felt our aches and pains. In order to take the power of death away from him who had the power of death, the devil, and to free man from slavery and the fear of death. In other words, we, we all know that we're going to die and we fear death, but we are freed from that fear knowing 
that Jesus Christ died for us. You know, anybody that, and we we have people on here who have lost loved ones, and 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 they they hurt, and death hurts. But we can look to Christ, and we can know that death is temporary. That Christ is going to return, and when Christ returns, we're going to be resurrected, and we're going to be changed, and we're going to become like him. So we, we, we don't have to fear knowing that Jesus Christ has died for us and that we can live forever with him in God's kingdom. Verse 16, he says, for assuredly, he does not give help to angels. Think, you know, that, that one kind of blew me away. He doesn't give help to angels, messengers, but he gives help to the descendant of Abraham. You know, uh, the author of Hebrews kind of kind of zeroed in right here, and he's speaking specifically to the people that he's writing this letter to, who are descendants of Abraham. And and I know a lot of us believe that we also are descendants of Abraham, but in in this case, verse sixteen, he says very clearly. He doesn't give help to angels, messengers, spirit beings, but he gives help to the descendants of Abraham. He didn't die for angels. He died for humans. And in this case, he's saying he died to help Israelites. After all, that's who this letter or book is, is written to. In verse 17, the author continues speaking of Christ having had to have been made like humans in order to become a merciful high priest by making propitiation or atonement for the sins of the people. Therefore, he had to be made like us in all things so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest. You know, he is our advocate. And we, we talked about this a few weeks ago. Michael and I were kind of uh, talking about this. Uh, and I know, I know the rest of you, I think we're on the same page. But Christ is on the right hand of God. And, and I, you know, I can only put this in human terms, but I can just see Christ saying, hold it, wait, Father, I've been there. I've done that. I know what it's like. Give these people a break, please. Don't wipe them out. Don't kill them. You know, uh, forgive them for they know what, not what they do. So he, he says he had to be made like us in all things so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in all things pertaining to God to make atonement for the sins of the people. For since he himself was tempted in that which he has suffered, he is able to come to the aid of those who are tempted. Father, please forgive them. Understand, I understand what they're going through. In verse 18, the author speaks of Christ's temptations. It says he was tempted. And he says that Christ, because of his humanity, because he was a human being, because of his suffering, because of his temptation, he can come to our aid. And in Hebrews 4.15, the author says this. We'll come to this in a few weeks. Next week, I guess, or not next week, but next time we, no, a couple of times. For we don't have a high priest who, who can't sympathize with our weaknesses. We've got one who's been there, who's been tempted in all things as we are, yet did not sin. And one thing, and I've mentioned this before, that just, I'm going to use a good old Southern term, it just blows me away that Jesus never had a bad thought, never had a sinful thought. Think about that. Not only did he never physically commit a sin, he never had a sinful thought. And that's where most of our sins begin, is in a thought. I say most, many of our sins 
So some people say that Christ could not have sinned. There are there are schools now that teach that Christ was what what they call impeccable. Impeccable means he could not have sinned. Impeccable means he could have sinned. I mean, if he could not sin, Skip, then then how could he have been tempted? Exactly. I just don't see it. Um, I've been told that 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 means that he chose it could have been done. And I'm like, okay. And and see, I don't argue with with my friends anymore. I state what I believe. They state what, what they believe. And then we move on to the next subject. And I highly recommend that to you all when you are speaking with people who have beliefs other than, than what we believe. The main thing is, do they believe in Christ and have they accepted his sacrifice and do they accept his blood and so on? That That's what's most important. And, I, you know, the rest of the stuff, I think it's just fun to talk about. I believe that we're supposed to observe the Sabbath, the holy days and so on. Uh, so I'm, I'm certainly not, not saying that, but um, I'm not going to argue with people about it anymore. They know where I am. They know what I believe. And, and we just, we don't fight. We have great conversations. Uh, I've even had conversations with my atheist friend. But anyway, uh, like Michael said, how on earth could he have been tempted if it was not possible for him to have sinned? So last definition of the day is... A skip? Yes, Barb. Yeah, uh, that last verse really spoke to me because uh, um, because he was tempted, he is able able to help uh, those that being tempted. So if I'm in prayer, I cannot say you don't understand or you don't know how it was or you don't know anything about it because it never happened to you. And but he is able to help us. Yeah. And, and you really had to be tempted. Yes, or he wouldn't understand, you know, what it what it's like. The father, unless, I think Michael mentioned this last week or week before last, the father feels it through the son, but if the son had not come to the earth and been tempted, neither one of them, uh, I don't think, speaking humanly, would have really understood what it's like to be a, a human being and know how hard it is for us to, to fight our own human nature, the world, Satan, uh, uh, you know, sin is fun. You know, yeah, on that note, yeah. on that note, Skip, uh, I think I mentioned last, last week, that's the reason why I understand Christ can truly be our advocate because he can explain to the father, like you said, the father feels it, understands it through Christ and what Christ went through um, because the father hadn't gone through that. It was the son that went into the creation as the creation or part of the creation, you know, regardless of what percent he was God or human and all that. It's interesting to consider, you know, but, uh, but yeah, he's our advocate and he can convey and, and have the father understand what it was like to be in that situation. Uh, one thing I wanted to mention um, before we get, before I forget and we go too far away from it, if you go back to verse 16 about that, uh, let me switch back over. Um, first, where I was reading from the New King James, which is, I don't know what you were, uh, your uh, slide was, but uh, it says, for indeed, he does not give aid to angels, but he does give aid to the seed of Abraham. I just want to pop over, I popped over to the King James Version just to see what it said. And it's totally different, which brings us back to this concept of if there's different translations, you know, if, or if a mistranslation can so change the entire meaning of a scripture, as Mike shared uh, in India, uh, and how people were believing that Christ was a created being because of the mistranslation. And I'm finding there's so many mistranslations that there's so many things that people have uh, gone off astray on just for that reason. But here, if we go to the King James Version, it's very different, and I'm not suggesting one is correct and one is incorrect. I'm just interested in looking at this because it says, and the King James Version is totally different. It says, for verily he took on, he took not on him. And of course, him 
the nature of aim of is on oh, italicized. Let's read it first. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. So that's an interesting different uh, translation. There's a bunch of italics there. So obviously it seems like some of the translators were struggling with this, with this particular scripture. Um, but I just wanted to share that, that that was a, definitely a different translation between the King James and the New King James. Yeah, that's interesting. I want to show you all, you know, I, I, I am not on contract with word search. I don't get a commission for mentioning uh, word search, but here's one of the things that, that, that I have the ability to, to see is I can, in this parallel Bible, I can list uh, all the translations that I want there. And there's, well, let me just show you, this will blow you away. Bibles. These are all the Bibles I have access to in word search. And I have chosen some that I have a little more confidence in. Um, and uh, what, what was that? Which verse was that, Bernard? 16? Yeah, 16. All right. Let's yeah, it might be interesting to see what the different Bibles, how they translate it. And it'd be an interesting study because it's definitely something interesting going on there and the use of um, these different words, whether it's aid or taking on the form of. Oh, I'm in, I'm in Hebrews 4. I don't need to be in 4 yet, do I? It's Hebrews 2, 16. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. All right. So you can see there the King James says what, what Bernard just read. He took on him took not on him the nature of angels. The NASB, which is what I have had up, for assuredly he does not give help to angels. Uh, the complete Jewish Bible, which by the way, I absolutely love. It's, uh, it's translated by Messianic Jews. So it's translated by people who knew a lot of Hebrew, knew a lot of Greek, but became Christians. So I think it's an excellent translation. Indeed, it's obvious that he doesn't take hold of angels to help them. On the contrary, he takes hold of the seed of Abraham. And then Holman Christian Standard Bible, I think is what HCSB is. It's clear he doesn't reach out to help angels. English Standard, uh, surely it's not angels that he helps. The NIV, for surely it's not angels he helps, but Abraham's descendants. The NLT too. Now that's the New Living Translation too. That's actually a translation. It is not a paraphrase. We also know that the son did not come to help angels. He came to help descendants of Abraham. And then verse uh, in uh, the New Revised Standard, it's clear that he didn't come to help angels. The Amplified, for as we all know, he did not take hold of angels, the fallen angels, to give them a helping hand, but he did take hold of, let me put down a little bit, See if I can get all of that. Well, I can't get all of it anyway. Uh, and then the the Young's Literal, which by the way is is a, is a good translation because it's it's a quote literal translation, and they're the ones that, that use the term messenger. For doubtless of messenger it does not lay hold, but of the seed of Abraham it lays hold. So anyway, that's uh, that's the parallel parallel Bible and as you, you all can see you know I've got uh, this this is where I do all of the preparation and, and word search makes it much easier for me I've got Bible translations over here I've got commentaries here in the middle and then over here I've got all my dictionaries and you can see there's a bunch of dictionaries not just strong so anyway sorry about that I'm not I'm not trying to sell word search <laughs> okay so yeah, my I got two things before you you, you carry on your next thought. One of them uh, is uh, based on a, a comment you made in regards to uh, the concept that um, that we have the advocate and and uh, and Jesus being our advocate can say to the Father, "Hey, uh, you know, cut him a break." You know, if we look at Elohim, if we look at, at the Mighty God as the Creator who made all things, I mean, He holds all the molecules of the physical you know, existence uh, in his will. He sets them all up and he's omniscient. But what's interesting about those verses is the fact when we look at that, is that even though he made all things, 
and he's in control and holds everything together by his will, um, he didn't he didn't have the experience or the perspective from the creation. Uh, but now that he, he does through his son, who emptied himself of divinity to become flesh, I think that's uh, kind of I was just fleshing out uh, the comment that you made in regards to that that um, that that he didn't even though he's a creator and he knows all things he didn't have the the perspective from uh, you know the, the flesh um, that we do and but his son does and as such he you know because of that experience because of the obedience that he learned by being in the flesh he is the perfect advocate for us because again he was tempted as all points as we are and therefore he understands things from a perspective that a creator may not have considered, um, even though he's God. So that's been my thought uh, on that regard. Second point is from Mike Kelly, who had a chat, who asked the question, so uh, would we sum up the first two chapters of Hebrews? He says, they seem to me to establish the superiority and reality of Christ as our Savior. That is exactly what the first two chapters are doing, Michael. Uh, Mike, um, apparently, and this is from my perspective, but apparently the author of Hebrews was concerned about his brethren, uh, which is sort of like a guy named Paul wrote in Romans 9. He was concerned about his brethren. I, you know, we, we talked about who may have written it, uh, and, and we don't really know, but anyway. That's exactly what the author is doing, in my opinion. He's showing the superiority of Jesus Christ. He's showing that Christ was the creator, that he's the sustainer. Um, and I, I, I know this is maybe a little too humanistic, what I'm about to say, but I look at the Father and the Son this way, that, that, that the Father, Father God, is a general contractor and his son is a subcontractor and he sends his son out to do certain things. One is to create the universe and so on. Then the son has subcontractors under him and we call them angels. We call them spirit beings. And then um, uh, like it's a holding company over, over to the side, we have man, and that one of these days, man is going to move up in the holding company structure and and be over, you know, angels and over God's creation and, and so on at, at his resurrection. So I, I think you're exactly right. Hebrews 1 and 2 do establish the superiority and the reality of Christ as our Savior. And anybody else jump in here? Yeah, I think that's a great allegory that you gave, Skip, especially when you consider the verses that uh, describe the fact that we are laborers in his harvest. You know, if you're looking at the father as a general contractor and uh, and then Christ as a subcontractor, you get all the way down to the fact that he's calling laborers into his harvest. You know, that we have the parable of, of the... Um, uh, the uh, uh, the man that uh, sends the servants out to find more laborers as the day wore on. And I think that's a very interesting allegory in modern parlance that you put together for us. So thanks for that. Bernard says that uh, we're going to have a, a spiritual promotion from flesh to spirit. Absolutely right. Uh, you know, Bernard, we've, we've talked, well, and everybody, we, we've talked many times about that uh, God gave us his Holy Spirit. And, and so dwelling inside each one of us, we have the most powerful force in the universe. You know, Michael's a big Star Wars fan. May the force be with you. May the Holy Spirit be with you. Uh, and uh, one of these days when Christ returns, and here's the way I look at it, that Holy Spirit that's inside of us is going to grow and grow and grow and grow until it changes, if you will, uh, changes us from flesh to spirit, as uh, Bernard just said. I don't know. I don't know a, a, a better way to put that. Um, uh, Mike, Skip, Mike Kelly has a comment. His mic is on. Okay, Mike.
Mike Kelly, you're up. Okay, maybe it was a mistake. Well, Blake had his mic on too. Yeah, I, I wanted to address the comment you made, Mike, uh, Michael, about um, this notion that, and I find it to be very endearing as well, very touching that Christ came here to experience life um, on earth, as it were, as a man, and, and such that we would, you know, come to him and say, well, you just didn't understand, Father. We had children with cancer. There was these horrific things. And he said, no, I was there. You know, um, I, I, I get it. You know, my, my children, I understand what you went through. And I love that idea, that concept that God loves us that much that he would he would come here to experience life, to be able to empathize with us, uh, uh, to the experience of what it was like to be human and to deal with um, evil and to deal with pain. But there's a part of me that wonders if there is something else that was going on, um, something in the mechanics of the way that the universe works and the way that they set things up such that he had to go through this process, had to be crucified, that something definitively changed that we're not aware of when he said it is finished. But there was something there that really took place more than just he wanted to be able to empathize. And maybe it's both. Maybe there was this, you know, there was two things going on there, but I, I, I have this lingering suspicion that there's something that they had to do to defeat death. Um, and this yes. is- the um, I don't know who said that, but yeah, but I think there's something else there as well. And, 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 I, and I love the idea and the concept that there was something there that you know, Christ could, could empathize with us. But I think there's something that we're not privy to that he had to do, that he had to go through this trial to be able to, to make a way for us all. Um, but yeah, that's, that's, that's what I wanted to share. Yeah. Yeah. Blake. Uh, uh, yeah, wait, Bert, yeah, Blake hold your thoughts. Hold your thoughts. Uh, I'm going to let Blake, Gio go. Hang on, Rod. Jill. <clears throat> uh, yes, I mean, Mike makes a, a great point because I was looking at this and I think if you, the point is, if you go back to um, verse 7 through 8, and it talks about how God made mankind lower than the angels, crowned him with glory and honor, put everything under him, but then it says God left nothing under, nothing that is not subject to them, yet at present we do not see everything subject to them. So my takeaway from this is that when, when man was created, it was intended that he sub be over all the creation. But when, when the serpent entered the garden and evil came into play, then you got this point down in verse um, 14 and 15, where it discusses that Jesus's um, purpose for what he did, like Mike said, it's much more than just empathizing with us. He had to destroy evil. He had to defeat evil. And it was only through his sacrifice and his blood being shed that he could defeat evil and therefore free us from the slavery of death that is in those verses. So to me, that's this, the whole point of these first two chapters, you know, that, um, that there was this necessary action uh, that needed to be taken that was more than just empathy for humankind. It was to defeat things because at some point after the creation, the concept of everything being subject to mankind didn't take place. It says, yet at present, we do not see everything subject to them. And it was because of the entrance of evil into the, the lives of mankind. And so anyway, that's my two bits. Okay, Rod. Uh, I agree with Blake that there's something else that we're not privy to some, to some things and the real meanings of them. Uh, and I think that this goes back or is, you know, part of what atonement is about. If you stop and you think about this, when before Christ uh, was transfigured and go, went to his father, you know, Mary tried to, you know, touch him. And he said, don't touch me because I have not yet ascended to my father. Well, 
he ascended to his father. And this was apparently what took place here was an atonement. Now, uh, we don't know, at least I spent a lot of my life trying to understand atonement, the deeper meanings of atonement. And I don't think that we have a full comprehension of what the day of atonement really means. But I do believe it is tied up into this thing, like Blake was mentioning, that there are just some things that right now, right now, we don't have a need to know or uh it's far it's too far above our heads and so you know i think this is tied up with atonement because the time frame is uh is the same and uh anyway that's all i've got to say okay anybody else i'm done by the way oh um, aren't you thankful <laughs> Well, to, to Blake's point and, and also what, what Jill mentioned, I, I put the text down there because as Blake is talking, I had a verse. I had a, a, a verse. I remember reading popping in my head, and I looked it up. The first one I found was Revelation thirteen eight, where he said, "I think there was, you know, something that, that else that was going on that for this whole plan." And as Jill articulated, and I, I, you know, when you look at Revelation thirteen eight, even though it's talking about the beast, it mentions that the, the lamb who was slain. From the foundation of the world you know that this plan was was established before the world was even created so um i think that that blake get your point jill your point i think uh, uh th th that all plays into it as well i think that verse kind of uh <clears throat> uh adds credence to what both uh, both of you were offering yeah i think it shows that you, you know god can look a little bit into the future he knows uh, what man has a tendency to do. And even before we were created, he knew that man was was not going to uh, obey his law per perfectly. Rod Kuzman says the old covenant was written on stone by finger, but the new is written on our heart. Christ's sacrifice was needed to access that. Yeah, that, that's, that's good, Rod. Well, I mean, to Jill's point, she was talking about the verses we read that in order to destroy evil, a mechanism had to be established from, pro, you know, and it looks based on what Revelation 13 says that from the foundation of the world. So this 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 mechanism had to be set uh, in place in order to destroy, you know, evil itself and to allow us to have life. I, I just think it just enhances what Jill was explaining. Yeah. Oh, Jill's on. Go ahead, Jill. Well, that I mean, that's laid out fairly clearly in verse 14 and 15. You know, it says he too shared in their humanity so that by his death, he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. I mean, that to me was the purpose of, of Jesus coming was to to take away from Satan the power of death. Okay. Yeah, bravo. All right, Bernard says, uh, for all the sins of mankind, blood had to be shed. Christ's blood was innocent in that he had no sin. Therefore, his perfect blood that was shed washed away the sins of all of mankind. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. The perfect that's... Is the Passover coming up, too. Yeah. Yeah, we need to talk about that a little bit. Does anybody else have anything on Hebrews? <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, um, the the next week or maybe even the next two weeks, uh, we are going to uh, discuss the Passover. And I, I'm not sure uh, we're going to have a little meeting a little bit later. <coughs> Excuse me. Got the sneezes. Um, about you know what, how how we want to handle that. So uh, hopefully everybody will uh, feel like joining us. By the way, we had thirty people. But excuse me, we had thirty computers. Uh, we probably had forty forty five people that were online with us today, which is a new record. 
And uh, we know of a couple of uh, church groups uh, that, that may join us next week also. So we may have 50 or 60 people on that online next Mike, week. Ellie's up. Okay, Mike. See, I keep seeing his microphone uh, go from uh, idle to on, but maybe he's not able to get a comment out. Yeah, I when I shared uh, a little bit with a couple of our folks who haven't, I don't think I've seen anybody of our congregation on here yet, but perhaps next week we'll have some. But um, I actually shared that, that turning your microphone on is the equivalent of raising your hand. Yeah, <laughs> yep, it is. Except the, the one that's doing the presenting cannot see that. Well, that's why there's somebody else that's always yeah. helping to look for hands. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah, Michael has job. been real good about help looking looking for me. So he's good at that. Yep, he is. Okay, does anybody else have anything else? We're, we we will be online next week. Same way, I will send out a uh, or Michael, one of us will send out a notice at uh, you know about about ten forty Central Time, and. Uh, if we continue to grow, Michael and I may both have to send it out because uh, my uh, go to meeting, um, I mean, my Gmail, they won't let me send out, but you know, so many emails a day. So, anyway, um, okay, and now, uh, Erica. yeah, Erica's up. who me, Erica. Okay. Hey, um, okay. are we continuing in Hebrews next week? Because Michael was telling me that we might do something different. We're going to do something about Passover next week, probably the next two weeks. Which gives me a, 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 a very nice break. I must say I'm dumbfounded that we went through this whole study for two hours without Erica using her microphone until now. <laughs> oh, no. Hey, Erica doesn't use her microphone much, so shut your mouth. <laughs> Oh, good. Skip? Yeah, Jim. Um, some will, some may bounce, but I have, uh, I have an uh, email sending program, Constant Contact, and if you sent me the list, I can send it to, you know, a few hundred without any problems. A few emails, you know, it doesn't go through because they think it might be spam because constant contact is used to, uh, you know, to market stuff as well as other things. But, uh, but I mean, I can send it and, it, you know, it just shows up as my email address. It doesn't show up as anything. Anyway, I'll send you, I'll send you an email. Uh, later and uh, tell you about it, but you know if you need to be able to send it 200 people, it could easily handle it. Yeah, and I, I just noticed something. By the way, uh, I've been telling people wrong. I thought that the subscription with GoToMeeting that we had would allow 150 computers online. This baby has 251, so I, I think we're okay. I think we can cover uh, much of the Church of God. <laughs> Uh, You've already passed ten percent. I know it. I know it. That's right. That's right. Well, well thanks, Dave, for your your offer to help. Um, I, I'm 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 working on a Reagan.com. I don't think I have any restrictions on the amount of emails that I can send out in bulk. But if we run into that uh, issue, then I'll, I'll we'll certainly you know take up your offer to, uh, of help there with your uh, constant contact. Yeah, Erica, you're up. If anybody sends me an email through using Constant Contact, it goes to my junk mail immediately because that's what a lot of telemarketers use. Right. Yeah, that, that's the only issue that we may have with that. Um, I would say one other thing, since we're on the subject of emails, uh, because a lot of the physical congregations with this virus crisis uh, have, have closed uh, to keep you know people from congregating and spreading the, the virus, um, if you have people in your congregation that are looking for a place to meet, if they want to meet with us, um, please make sure that uh, before we get to next Sabbath or for the Bible studies during the week that you would get either me, myself or Skip uh, the email address of the person, that the people that want to join us. 
because okay. Skip and I have to add those to our, our email list or to send out the link so that they can actually join us. And their so, full uh, name. And their full name. Yes, and their full name. And we would need that before uh, either the Bible study on, on Tuesday night or the Sabbath. And we can't really do it like, you know, 10 minutes before we begin. So if you have people that you're wanting to, to join, please get that, uh, their email addresses or have them contact uh, Skip or myself so we can add their email uh, to our to our list. Thanks. And one other thing that you can do, uh, you can forward to someone the link that, that Michael or I send out. And uh, uh, the uh, the link to our Bible study would be in your forward. So that's another way that they could join. You know, if somebody says, "No, nah, I don't want to. I don't want to add my name to to that list because I don't know how long this is going on." Fine, just uh, send them. Just forward uh, to them and include the link, and uh, and they can they can get on. Also. Uh, and, and I've got to leave here just, yeah, and we're going to do Passover too. Thanks, Rod. Um, uh, Diane and I have a four and a half hour drive that we have to make uh, right now. So I'm going to skip the, the uh, uh, prayer request part. If you have prayer requests, please send them to me and I will put them on our list and I will get them out uh, to everybody.